Okay, should be live. Let us know if you can hear us. Always uh, wondering if everybody can for sure hear us. Mm -hmm. We're not on that end. So, first of all, we have a lot of people in the comments already that have said where they're from. We've got all over the place, Kentucky, North Carolina, Washington, Missouri. Good to see you all. Calico Acres is here to be a moderator, and my sister Shree is here, too, to be a moderator. So, if you start acting up, they're going <laughs> to kick you out. Yeah. All right. We have some great questions to answer. We asked some, we asked for questions on our YouTube channel and also Michelle did on Instagram. We got some great questions. We want to talk about some practical stuff and also some deep stuff. So I think this will be good. Um, and I want to read the first comment to you that kind of inspired the title of this live, the title of the live, How to Become a Homesteader. And I'm just going to read that to you. And this wasn't actually in response to um, us asking for questions, but it was a comment that we got that I just thought was a really good place to start. I'm struggling with finding the how-tos of flipping from a crazy non-homestead style life into our new lifestyle. We moved into this 125-year-old farm after living in our camper with our family of six while we attempted to make it livable. That's big stuff. I think that was something you understand too, LOL. But last year, we whipped up a quick garden just to see what the soil was like here, etc., I wasted so much food from zero knowledge. I'm looking to see if you have posted somewhere on how to make that transition into this lifestyle. Where you jump into this life having nothing. What products are most important that you've purchased or built? Step-by-step -step ways of how to harvest correctly and store food. So I'm actually going to get, we'll get back to that question in a little bit. I'm going to wait until there's a few more people on here. We've already got close to 100. No, there are just over 100. Um, but I do want to wait just a little bit to get back to that one. So we've got some other questions to go to first just want to say hi to a few of you uh, we got people from minnesota montana georgia texas oregon ireland really really good to see each one of you here and like i said when we open this up we're going to go through some questions that people gave and i think this will be a lot of fun so so let's see i'll ask this question and then i'll let you answer it all right okay so the first question is from somebody named Michelle. Uh, wait, let's get that one. Here we go. Uh, somebody named from Michelle said, hello from Ireland. Absolutely love your channel. I'd love to know how you guys squeeze so much work into your days. Are you very strict with your organization or do you end up working late hours? Thank you so much for sharing what you do. Hugely inspirational and motivating and a beautiful family inside and out. Thank you so much for the kind words. Mm -hmm. So. What do you think about that? How do we get so much done in a day? Well, I mean, number one, we've been doing this for a long time. And that makes a huge, huge difference. I mean, like every year, not every year, but the last few years, I've been like, it feels like I'm missing something. Like, is there something that we're not doing? But it's just that we get more efficient as the years go by and tasks that used to look really huge don't look as big anymore. Um, Cody just went on vacation for, was it three days, four days? Mm -hmm. And I was like worried about getting all the stuff done here on the homestead. And it was crazy because I actually called him up and I was like, hey, am I missing something? Like I barely did any chores this morning. Right. And it was just because everything was so streamlined and simple that, and also our children help us with chores. So that's another big part of it. We have a 10 year old, a nine year old and an eight year old, and they actually do quite a bit around here with right. chores and things like that. Um, so I am a very, personally, a very organized person when it comes to schedule. If you look in some of my drawers, you might not think I'm as organized, <laughs> but I am, um, I, I love schedules and routines. And whenever there's something that I know like has to be done every single day, I'll like make a system for it. So like I try to wash the milk dishes, the milking dishes, like, um, kind of on the back of doing breakfast. That way it doesn't get missed. Mm -hmm. And like the Berkey needs to be filled every day. And so I have that on one of the children's job lists. And so things like that that have to get done every single day, I will often like have a system for it. Cody is not quite as scheduled and organized as mm -hmm. I am. And so that that's kind of like one of our biggest like issues with getting along is just like, I have my routines and I don't like being flexible. And then Cody is very flexible, but I think we found a decent middle ground yeah. um, with that. And like we, 
I respect the fact that he can be more flexible than I can be. And then he respects the fact that, okay, I do need some routine in my life. So, right. Um, and as for working late, we try really hard not to work late. Yeah. Um, like we never are going to be outside working for sure. Not past like eight 30 or nine in the evening. We used to, we used to a we lot. Used to. I used to more than she did when we were first, like getting everything started around here, building stuff. I worked hours and hours and hours. And we'll say, and we'll kind of get back to this later with that question that I gave at the beginning of this um, on kind of getting started with homesteading and stuff. But I will say that that was not healthy. Like there were some things that we did have to do to get started, but mm -hmm. I took it too far. Definitely. For sure. It was hard on our marriage. It was hard on our family. It was just, it was hard on our health. Michelle mm -hmm. burned out, got adrenal fatigue and I'm getting to the place where I might be coming down with some of the same type of stuff, just working ourselves too hard. And we're, we're learning from that. And basically just we realize we do have to take a step back and just not work yeah. ourselves too much. So we're very intentional about we try to have the kids in bed by nine o'clock. I mean, they are in bed by nine o'clock practically every single evening. And then me and Cody try to be in bed by like nine thirty and we can watch a movie and hang out and stuff. So we that is something that um, I especially am like, we've got to be in bed by nine thirty. <laughs> I do not like working late. Um yeah. So, and the type of work that we do after supper isn't like man, like hard manual labor. Like it's right. more just like you know stuff around the homestead that's actually somewhat relaxing. We see it as our free time yeah. work. It does change a little bit in the summer. Like you were saying that while I was gone on vacation a few mm -hmm. days ago, that you didn't have a lot mm -hmm. to do. And it's true, we have streamlined things, made things more efficient, but also it's not quite in the, like the thick of spring and summer yet so more yeah. things do happen and as the days get longer we do more we try to rest a lot more during the winter and then kind of build up an energy to be able to use that in the spring and summer because yeah. it does get really yeah. crazy around here well and there's always these seasons like spring is when we work the most and right. so if we have to compromise our standards a little bit in the spring it's fine we're okay right. with that yeah yeah all right let's go on to another one this one came from somebody pipsqueak Mm -hmm. Um, I think I've heard hints of Michelle having some health issues. Are you still thinking of moving? Love your detailed videos on animals in the garden. You guys are our favorite homesteaders. That's really good to hear. So maybe I'll say a little bit. Or did you have something? Okay. So I, I will say something. I'm not even sure if we ever actually said anything about moving on a channel. I'm not quite sure where that came from. I think maybe I that was a misunderstanding. <laughs> but behind the scenes. We had actually been talking about it a little bit. We were thinking of possibly looking for a place with more acres. We do need a bigger house. Uh, we built our house in like the barest, smallest we could get away with when we first started so that we could do it and get out of debt as soon as possible. But our kids are growing and just it's it's different when you have a homestead. You've got so many more things going on. You've got we've got our laundry room full of chore boots and just all of the uh, milk dishes and just yeah. all of the food storage and everything like that it does take more space than maybe just a regular lifestyle mm -hmm. if you want to put it that way so we do um, need a bigger house we would like to have more land and we considered looking for another place but we kind of came to the place that we want to make the most of what we have yeah. like i feel like um what we did when we got started we bought our house or we bought this property built the house and we started out we we did things as fast as we could we threw up a garden shed we threw up a hoop house for the chickens and we did stuff like that but we kind of stopped there we didn't go farther and really just like make this into the place of our dreams and i think we could still do that there's a lot that we can do we've got five and a half acres um yeah. even the swamp land we have i think that's about an acre mm -hmm. um that could be filled up with dirt and we could add an acre to our property by doing that so there's things we can do and i think that's where we are right now we want to make the most of what we have. Yeah. You want to add to that? Well, I mean, the other thing about moving is it would be so hard for me to leave the gardens that I've worked so hard on. Like we've built the soil up like crazy and mm -hmm. like our grapevines are going to start producing soon. We have raspberries that are producing. We have a um, asparagus patch, rhubarb, all those perennials and stuff. It would just be really hard for me to leave. But then the house is just too small. Our family has outgrown it. Yeah. So definitely we're going to have to do an addition on the house at some point. Um, but there's just like so many, I don't think I could bear to leave this property until we like clean out fence rows and like get it to where we can drive in the lane and not feel like we have so much work staring at us. 
Yeah, I get so, overwhelmed every time I drive in the lane, and, and that's yeah. not a good thing. It's not a good feeling. Yeah, there's just a lot of improvements that we could do around here yet. So. Yeah. Yep. John Van Rooten, I just discovered you guys today. Welcome here. Oh, nice. Glad you're here. And he watched the video about uh, my dad's cast. That was one of my favorite videos to do. That was really hard at the in the moment to deal with that cast yeah. in the middle of the night stuff, Stressful. bringing in the house and everything. But uh, it was a good video yeah. to do. Um, what this person asked about health issues, like I definitely have had health issues in the past, but at this point I have pretty much conquered a lot of them. I still have some like food sensitivities and like stress. I have to really watch myself, but I mean, I'm doing, I feel really good and I'm doing, I'm doing very, very well. I would not, I don't think I would put myself into the category anymore of like having major health issues. Right. But it was a very long journey. And a lot of people have asked us about it. And we've been talking about this a lot recently because I've started having some of the same symptoms that she had. And for her, and we talked a little bit about like schedule and stuff. So for her, she got to the place where she was, she had adrenal fatigue and she was really tired, could just hardly get up and do stuff and whatever. Mm -hmm. She came to the place where she had to rest and she had to take a step back and stop doing all the things. I didn't come to that place. And I did slow down from when we started. Um, I'm not working quite as hard as I was then, but um, I still go at it pretty hard. And I'm getting to the place where I have some of the symptoms of adrenal fatigue and stuff. And so we've been talking about it a lot. And what do you want to say is the main thing that people should do if they're dealing with something like that? Just like learn to rest, learn to say no, and just like learn to be okay with not getting everything done. And like actually like put chunks of time into your routine for rest, like mm -hmm. specifically for rest. I take two hours, a two hour chunk out of every single afternoon where I am intentional about doing nothing that does not feed my soul. <laughs> like right. if it's going to stress me out, if it's a phone call that's stressing me out, I will not do it in that two hour span of time. I also have an hour in the morning before the kids get up and people are like, how do you do that with kids? You just like, um, I don't know, you train you your kids. You have to make the schedule. Yeah, and you train your kids to respect your quiet time and mm -hmm. like it's my kids don't resent my quiet time at all. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just something you work into your into your days and um so much of it is a mind thing. Um focusing on being grateful, like our thoughts literally change us. Mm -hmm. And that was another really huge piece that was other for me. Yeah. Howdy to all of you that are showed up here. I'm seeing oh, wow. a whole lot of different places come up. Got some Ohioans. I always have a little bit of uh, hesitation when I greet Ohioans. I feel like I should be like, oh, H-I-O, and just like <laughs> excited stuff. But Ohio is not my growing up state. And I really haven't. I am an Ohioan. I'll admit it. But it's really hard for me to do that, you know, get into the whole yes, O-H-I-O <laughs> thing and stuff like that. Anyways, welcome here, fellow Ohioans. I want to grab a comment real quick that somebody left because people do often ask this. I thought that's interesting. Um, How did you two meet? I saw you in your Mennonite dress in a picture on one of your videos. Mm -hmm. So Michelle grew up Amish Mennonite. I grew up a form of Mennonite and joined the Amish Mennonite church. And we actually met at a Bible school in Arkansas. And I was living in Colorado and she was living in Ohio. <laughs> crazy. And uh, we ended up dating, getting married, yeah. and we're no longer a part of that church anymore. So you probably noticed that in our videos. We look a little different. So. Yeah. But, that is where it came from. Just so you know. Mm -hmm. All right. I did not mean to click on that. All right. Let's move on. We'll do one more question real quick. And then this is just going to be a quick question. And we'll get back to that one that I mentioned at the beginning. that we want to talk a little more in depth about. So from Shub's Adventures, howdy from your neighboring state of Indiana. Would you all ever do a meet and greet? So. That is a interesting question. I would love to do it sometime. We've talked about it. Um, a lot of people have asked about coming to our farm and seeing our farm and meeting us here and stuff. And unfortunately, we can't do that just because we get so many requests for it. It would just it feels like there would just be so many people coming and going. We're not set up for it at all. Yeah. And we also just we really want our privacy. So mm -hmm. we put a lot of our life into these videos and you see a lot of our life. And so we want to keep some of the parts of our life just to ourselves. We need to have yeah. our own life. We don't want our children to grow up just like in the spotlight all the time and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we do want to be careful with that. But 
I would love to maybe get together sometime, like maybe in Columbus, Ohio, or something like that too, or something like that, and be able to meet and greet, whatever. But we are also going to be speaking at the independent Food Independence Summit in Holmes County in June, I believe it is. We're going to be speaking there, and I'm not sure which evening it is, but one of those evenings they're doing a like meet and greet barbecue type thing or whatever, and we're planning to be there for that. So if you want to um, look it up, I'll try to drop in the, a link in the description after we're done here for the Food Independence Summit. Um, you can go check that out, and you can come to that, and then you can see us there. We would love to see you, say hi, talk a bit, and do stuff like that. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. So um, back to the question from the beginning. This is what kind of inspired the title, How to Become a Homesteader. Then there's a few other questions that we got from people that kind of went along with it. So we're going to kind of um, lump those together. But the first one was, I'm struggling with finding the how-tos of flipping from a crazy non-homestead style life into our new lifestyle. We moved into this 125-year-old farm after living in our camper with our family of six while we attempted to make it livable. I think that was something you understand too, LOL. Yes, we did live in a camper while we were getting our homestead started. And it was not very much fun. <laughs> but last year we whipped up a quick garden just to see what the soil was like here, etc. I wasted so much food from zero knowledge. I'm looking to see if you if you have posted somewhere on how to make that transition into this lifestyle. Where you jump into this life, having nothing, what products are most important that you purchased or built, step by step ways of how to harvest correctly and store food, basics one one. That was the end of that comment. And then there was another question we got. Um, Melissa said, we are getting ready to build our homestead from scratch and struggling with how to lay things out. House, barns, gardens, pastures. Do you have any insights, things you love or things you do differently? Um, you want to start with that? Shall I start with the first question? Yeah, I'll start with the first one. Okay. Um, so the first thing I noticed in that question was the thing of like wasting tons of food because they just didn't have any knowledge um, before they started their garden and stuff. And so I know I've said this a hundred times, I feel like a broken record, but like before, first and foremost, I think it's just so important to not take on too many new projects at one time. Um, mm -hmm. it just doesn't really work on any level to take on too many projects at one time, right. because like what happens is you're just going to burn out and you're not going to be able to like take a full advantage of each, of each thing. Um, I wasted so much garden food because I didn't have time to cook it up. So I grew the food and then I would waste it because I had like three little kids and I, it was so much easier just to pull out some pasta. And so I didn't actually even grow. I didn't even cook all the food that I was able to grow in my garden that first year. And so like take it in just like little tiny little pieces. Don't get animals before you have your fences up and your barns up your shelters up like don't even look for animals because <laughs> <laughs> you'll find them trust me they're find everywhere them. they will be there waiting for you once your shelters and your fences are up and things like that right so that's like just my biggest biggest nugget for anybody is when you're starting from scratch like build your house before you go and try to have a really successful garden another thing for me if i had to do it over would be I would put in a few raised beds with really good soil that I know can grow anything. And I would just like plant a couple raised beds full of stuff while, you know, I'm building my house or something. But if you go and like dig up, like till up a garden for a first year garden, often those gardens are really difficult to deal with. They've got right. like big grass, chunks, to grow grass chunks and stuff. So we did that when we moved here we just tilled up some of the lawn and I put in a big garden. It was a complete fail. I wasted so much time in that garden, got basically nothing from it. And it was just so much stress. Like go ahead and till the garden, but like put a whole bunch of compost on it and plan to cover crop or something right. and focus on like getting your soil better so that you can easily have a garden. Just, just do like very, um, doable things although you keep talking somebody's at the door <laughs> somebody's at the door um another thing that i had as far as like tools and things that i would do i would get like a water bath canner and just do like simple water bath things um another thing is i would like practice making food like from things like from other people like buy things at a local farm or just practice making um Practice making ingredients into food before you even grow it so that once you do grow your own precious food and then you know exactly what to do with it. That's 
that's another huge one for me. Another thing, um, like as in like when you do grow a lot of food, don't be scared, especially those first years, don't be scared of like blanching things and just sticking them into the freezer. <laughs> um, I just think it's like people are like, oh, you shouldn't be using freezers. What if the freezer goes out? If you don't have time to can everything, um, you don't have all the expensive tools like freeze dryers and things like that. Honestly, just a good old freezer. We we survived on a freezer and some canning shelves for like a long time. So mm -hmm. you don't have to have all the fancy equipment to process your food. And so, oh, yeah. I missed. Oh, he didn't miss a ton. Another thing. This is another really, really big thing, in my opinion. If I was starting out and I really wanted to have a garden, I would focus on growing root veggies that don't need to be preserved. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just like even just grow, like plant 30 pounds of potatoes. That's going to make a huge dent in your self-sufficiency goals. Right. And you don't have to um, process any of that. Right. So, it, I mean, you can eat some broccoli for lunch and it's not going to fill you up. You can eat a sweet potato for lunch and it's going to it's going to make you feel a lot more full than some broccoli. And so I just I just think that root veggies are the way to go when you're starting out and you're overwhelmed. Just start really, really small and um, master a few things before you try right. to pile other things on because you're just going to get so overwhelmed. Right. When we first got started, I read tons of books. I was super excited to get started with this homesteading life and I wanted to do all the things and I wanted to do all the things right away. And I mean, it drove us nuts kind of. I mean, we were just working so hard and so long and we were failing over and over and over. We were trying to do so many things at once. And if we would have started with just like one or two things, got good at that, moved on to the next thing and the next thing, we could have, I think, gotten so much farther, even oh, yeah. faster because we would have actually been <clears throat> better at it and more efficient at it. But well, we were trying to do all the things at once and it was just, it wasn't efficient. And we wouldn't have had to battle the discouragement of all the failures that right. way either, mm -hmm. because we had so many more failures because we were doing so many things. I remember still when we got our, our first cow, our first milk cow, I think that was our, like our biggest That's learning curve yeah. on the homestead was getting a large animal. And I just remember feeling so completely overwhelmed. Like it felt like life stopped when we got a cow because mm -hmm. our mornings were tied up. Cody had to go to work. And so I had to get up early and like try to get this cow to cooperate. It was, it was just miserable and our shelters weren't done yet. And yeah. it wasn't, don't do it. Just don't do it. <laughs> I mean, not don't get a cow. No, I don't get thing. a cow, <laughs> but maybe starting, don't get a cow when you're still trying to figure out how to garden mm -hmm. and still trying to figure out how to take care of your chickens and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, there was a couple questions I thought we could just mm -hmm. quick grab before we keep moving on. How old are you both? We're in our mid thirties. Uh, have you thought of any dairy goats or sheep? Yeah. Are <laughs> planning basically planning on getting sheep? I think. I want sheep really bad. Yeah. I, um, my doctor actually told me that I would be able to tolerate sheep's milk much, much, much better than cow or goat. And so I, I, I want sheep now. Right. Because I don't I don't know what it's like to be able to eat dairy without, you know, having to be careful about my stomach hurting. So. I, I've, I've actually always wanted sheep. When we first started, before we got a cow, I don't know if you remember or not, but I talk about getting milking sheep um, a lot. Yeah. And I wanted to do that. But we ended up getting a cow and a cow is a really good thing, but I would still be excited about getting sheep. Yeah. Um, do you guys have a video of how to build your root cellar food storage room? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Um, it's definitely look an older it, video. But I will, if I remember, I will try to put a description in there. Yes, it is an older video. Yeah. Not one that I'm necessarily super proud of, but it is about how it to build the It gets the job set. done. It does get the job done. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. How do you incorporate young children into your homesteading routine? So mm -hmm. we just did a video. Which one was that? Was it two videos know. ago? A couple of videos ago, we did a video a kind of about a little bit of our day in life. Oh, day in life, yeah. And we talked about the children um, and the things they do. Uh, we give them some chores to do. They each have kind of their own specific things. Um, we don't just try to, you know, make them do all the different things and whatever. It's like one of them gives the cows water. One of them gathers the eggs. One of them feeds the chickens and things like that. 
Um, that way they can master that thing and then they know that they're responsible for that every day. They also get paid to do it so that they have a little bit of incentive that gives mm -hmm. them their spending money and stuff like that. One thing that we are very passionate about is not homesteading in a way that makes our children will, will resent the homestead later in life. Um, yeah. It's not that we think that they have to homestead when they no. get older, totally up to them. But at least if they don't resent it and that mm -hmm. if it's something that they'd want to do, they could actually enjoy doing it because they weren't just forced to do all this hard work and work late in the night every night and have their mom and dad stressed out about it all the time. Yeah. We don't always do the best with that, but we really try. Yeah. Another thing that I will say is that um, if the person who, who said this, like you're, you said, young children, if you're talking about like babies. So I was at a place where I had three babies in diapers. I had a one-year-old, a two-year-old, and a three-year-old. Um, and it was it was chaos. And one thing that we we look back on and uh, we regret is that we didn't spend more time with our babies. Like yeah. we regret that we didn't just like soak up those baby years. We were really stressed. We were overwhelmed. We were trying to do it all at the time. And so if you do have babies, like just be extra gracious with yourself and like don't try to do it all. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, you you decide what's too much for you, but like for sure, soak up that time with your babies because. I mean, we have four kids and I can't, I can't believe we had four babies. I mean, it's such a short little space in time and don't waste yeah. it. Yeah. We feel like with our, well, there was more space with our last one and we felt like we did a lot better job mm -hmm. at spending time with her, um, <clears throat> figured a few things out. So I haven't figured it all out, yeah. a few things. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what state are you in? We're in Ohio, by the way. Yes. Yeah. And howdy to all of you fellow Ohioans again. I see more of them join. There's a lot of you people in here. It's so good to see you all. Can you tell us where you're from? And we're going to keep going. Um, <clears throat> you kind of talked about all that stuff, right? Yes, I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. There was a couple other questions that kind of went along with what we were talking about there. We didn't talk about this, though. Okay, um, yeah. We are getting ready to build our homestead from scratch and struggling with how to lay things out, house, barns, gardens, pastures. Do you have any insights, things you love or things you do differently? Um, do you have much to say about that? Or do you want me to take it? My biggest tip, I feel like Cody's the one who's going to have to talk about this for the most part, but my biggest tip would be don't put your gardens too far away from your house. <laughs> no. And I just say that because like, if you want a little bit of something out of your garden while you're cooking, I just find that it's much, much harder to get things done when your garden is far away than when it's like close to your house. We actually have a garden that's a few feet away from our house and I love it. It's one of our two gardens. Um, it's just so nice because like in the evenings you can just step outside and pull a few weeds or something. Whereas if a garden, I have had a garden that's further away and I just couldn't stay on top of it somehow. And another thing is like making sure that you have hydrants like water close to your gardens and animals yeah for sure <laughs> we did not have that in the beginning and it just made everything a complete headache like we had to haul water to the animals in buckets and it was just it was so hard yeah so strategically place all of your water yeah. systems um for us we bought this property there was actually an old house here that we tore down and we built on top of the basement that they had built for that house and so we didn't really have a choice. I mean, we could have started over, um, but we didn't want to do that. We were trying to save as much money as possible. So we built on top of the basement that was already here. And so we didn't really have a choice as to where we would place the house. And it is in kind of a, an awkward spot. It's Our property is in the shape of an L and our house is kind of on the corner of one of the L's. And so like we don't really have anything on two sides of our house. We don't really have any space. And so the garden is in front of the house and the barns are next to it and it works out pretty well. Um, if I had to, if I had the choice to begin with, I would have put our house like way back on the back side of our property and give us more privacy and um, stuff like that. But uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I would know how to like explain what I would do differently or whatever. Hmm. But basically, like Michelle said, I would keep the gardens close to the house, whether it's in the front or the back. I don't think that really mm -hmm. matters. I would probably maybe put it in the back if it was up to me, just because sometimes the garden can tend to look a little messy. <laughs> yeah. But um, besides that, keep it close to the house. It's nice to have the barn kind of close to the house, 
but I wouldn't keep it too close just because of the smell sometimes. Um, <clears throat> most of the time it's not bad, but when I clean it out in the spring after the winter, it can smell pretty bad. So mm -hmm. you want it too close, but you want it close enough that it's not bad to carry the milk bucket back and forth and stuff like that. So it's really kind of just like learning to deal with what you have. I think that's going to be the way it is for anybody. I mean, if you look at a hundred homesteads, they're going to be a hundred different looking homesteads. Like yeah. no homestead is the same. There's no like, this is the best setup for a homestead. It's going to depend on who you are, what you like, what you need, what kind of animals you plan on having, mm -hmm. how much garden space you plan on having. It, a lot of it's just going to depend so much on that. And yeah, I'd say you're just going to kind of have to figure it out, see what works for you. Um, big tips. I think like Michelle said, one of the biggest tips is having water at all the strategic yes. places. It took us years to get that, but that made the biggest difference for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, not much more about that. Another thing that we, a mistake that we made when we um, did our homestead was we weren't strategic enough with planting like where we planted our trees. Mm -hmm. And it ended up that we had to like take out a few trees that we had already like they'd been growing for five years and we made massive strides with these huge trees and we had to like tear them out and it was pretty devastating. So like be sure to calculate how big a tree will actually get right. before you plant it too close to your house. And like, you don't want to plant cherry trees beside pastures because cows, they can, can't be, toxic eat, they can be toxic cows. for cows. Yeah. Just like thinking about those things, I think is really important. Like thinking, thinking everything through like crazy. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, you could overthink it. Don't overthink yeah. it. And you also, you're probably not going to think of all the things. And some of those things that we had to do, um, like taking out trees, it's just learning. It's just, learning. It's just a tree. Yeah. We planted more trees. Um, one thing I will say, though, is we started out with electric fencing. We're still using electric fencing. I would highly recommend that to anybody getting started with animals because it's very cheap to put up. I mean, I literally only spent like a few hundred dollars to put up yeah. all of our fence. Um, and it's movable. I've moved so many fences, things that I thought, you know, this would work great, this amount of space here, ended up that I needed to move it for one reason or another. And I'm so glad that we did not spend the money to put permanent fencing in to begin with because we would have had to work around that so much. Yeah. So that is Definitely. one thing that I would for sure recommend. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of along with some of what we were talking about there, question from somebody named Cody. Hi, Cody. We do spell your name wrong. <laughs> no, my name is spelled with an I. This is Cody with a Y. My question would be, how long did it take you to build your house on a low income? As I am currently dealing with that, I want to buy materials with cash as I go. How do I stay patient for the multiple years it will take? Any tips would be appreciated. Thanks. So we did a video not too long ago where we were talking about um, building our house. And we did not do it with cash, but we were trying to do it with as small of a loan as possible. We hadn't been using any credit cards or anything like that. We didn't have any credit built up. So... We couldn't actually get a regular loan, so we ended up getting a loan, a personal loan, and we couldn't, it couldn't be a huge loan. Plus, we just didn't want to be in debt for a long time. So, yeah. sorry. We didn't want to be in debt for a long time, so we were trying to build it as cheaply as possible. It did take us two years to build our house. Um, it took us one year to get to the place where we get final inspection so we could move into the house, but there was a lot of things that were not done. It took another year to yeah. finish it. Um, my biggest tips, I think with that would be don't neglect other important things in your life, <laughs> your family, your marriage, things like that. Uh, it's not worth it. Um, I would rather have been in debt longer or, mm -hmm. um, not gotten a house of our own or whatever it took to not neglect those things. But if you can do it and not neglect those things, then go for it. Um, mm -hmm. and I will say too, it's very admirable that you are um, very admirable that you want to do it with cash. And if that's something that you feel like you can do, go for it. I would also say that there is no shame in getting at least some loan to do it, to be able to get things done um, and make sure that it doesn't just keep stretching out longer and longer and longer. Um, for us, it was kind of like we could either be pouring money into a rental or we could be pouring money into a loan. Yeah. And I would have rather been doing that. Plus the thing was, it, it's the type of thing. Some people say then you're like a slave to the lender, but, for me, it was like, if we ended up not being able to make the payments, we could give the person the house and they would end up with more than we owed them for the house. Mm -hmm. um, and 
then we'd be without a house. Well, if you can't make your rent payments, you're going to get kicked out there as well. So anyways, just some thoughts on that. Yeah. Oh, and then along with that, um, maybe Michelle could talk about this one then a little bit. Do you have any recommendations on how to get enough money to buy a property without being able to work? I'm severely disabled, so I can't work. I'm an only, I'm only on a pension. Love your channel so much. And Michelle is so stunningly gorgeous. <laughs> You're a lucky guy. Well, I do agree with that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, to me, that's a, it's a valid question. It's a little bit humorous because it's like, I mean, if you can't work, I don't know how you're going to be able to make money to buy a house or whatever. But so I don't really have an answer specifically to that. Um, but we did talk about it a little bit. What, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think you could like look at this a few different ways. And I mean, I don't know exactly where this person was coming from with this question, but you don't have to kind of kind of the point I would like to make is that you don't have to actually have a homestead to support this way of life and yeah. to to love this way of life. You can have some container gardens in your house or on your porch. You can also like support local farmers if you really love the food and that's something you want, but you can't you aren't capable of actually doing that on a property. Support others who are. I mean, right. there's local farmers who are going to be going to um farmers markets and even like in walmart and kroger sometimes they'll have grocery they'll have like produce that says like from like this is local to ohio buy that food like spend a little extra money on that food and support the cause in that way you don't have to have a homestead of your own to like live the dream or to support the dream or if you know what I mean. And so I, I guess that's just kind of coming coming at it from a bit of a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, because if you are severely disabled and you have a big piece of property, you're probably going to have to pay someone to take care of it. And right. um, so, yeah, that's just just a thought. I don't know the person who actually gave. The right. It's hard to so. give, like, obviously, mm -hmm. um, a specific answer to that, not knowing the whole situation, and everything. But yeah. there is a point to get across that basically everybody looks at it as like the ultimate it's the dream to have your own property and you know live that life of freedom and whatever and it is a good dream i i love it that we have our own property but that's not the only way to do it we started homesteading when we were living in a basement apartment zero land of our own um but we started doing those things we asked our landlords if we could put in a raised bed we put in a raised bed michelle grew some herbs and some stuff like that um we ended up we asked if we could put in a little chicken coop we got chickens Michelle canned stuff in our little basement. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. Even like, okay, say you want tomato products. You want to can tomato products. We did farmer's market for a couple years. And speaking from experience, I guarantee you, if you go to a farmer's market and get to know somebody a little bit, a farmer, and tell them that you would like to do like bulk canning and you'd like to buy bulk tomatoes from them, guarantee you they'll give you a better deal on them. Um, and also... I guarantee you there's a lot of tomatoes that they didn't bring to the farmer's market that were like seconds mm -hmm. that you could easily use for canning. And if you tell them, hey, next Saturday I'm coming by, I'll buy a whole box of seconds from you. They'll bring those for you. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different things you can do like that. You could buy milk and learn to make cheese. And you can you could do those things that you could put meat in your freezer, um, stuff on your canning shelf, and different things like that where you could be somewhat – sustainable without actually yeah. growing all the food yourself and there's a lot of things you can grow in a very small space if you use raised bed and containers and stuff yeah definitely yep. absolutely i want to look at a few of your questions here right. just good stuff there was one about raw milk being scared to drink raw milk and our thoughts on that you could give some thoughts on raw milk i don't remember where that was it, I but, saw it. I just remember it. And, and then I saw a few more people asking about raw milk. Okay. We do drink raw milk. We don't mm -hmm. talk about it a whole lot on our channel as far as just like the ins and outs of drinking raw milk, just because it is kind of a volatile subject. And in a couple of different ways, um, one, we can get, we end up getting a lot of hate from vegans when we talk about um, uh, dairy products and stuff because we're exploiting the cow and stuff like that. We don't feel that way at all. Um, so that's one reason we don't always talk about that stuff. But another reason is just because it's not legal in a lot of states. It's, it's not legal in Ohio to sell raw milk. We can do herd shares and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, we do talk about our cow and everything, but just like how we feel about drinking raw milk, we don't talk about it too much. But anyways, I feel totally fine about it. 
I did not grow up drinking raw milk. Um, when we first got started, I was a little bit hesitant, I think. Um, I wanted to, you know, make sure that everything was okay and really clean and stuff like that. But um, I've come to a place where it just, I mean, I haven't given it a second thought whatsoever. I feel safer drinking the raw milk than buying a gallon of milk from the store, honestly. People have been drinking raw milk for generations. I'm not Thousands saying, of years. I'm not saying that everything that people have done for generations and generations is safe. <laughs> but I mean, like cheeses and yogurt and like butter and all those things, like, if you don't cook dairy, it ferments beautifully on its own. But once you pasteurize it, and then you have to add cultures back in. Right. And I mean, people didn't have access to those cultures. And so, right. like, to me, this is something very natural, very normal. I think it's amazing that milk can ferment like that on its own and still be palatable and taste good and like become a food. It goes from a liquid mm -hmm. into a solid. I think that's incredible. And personally, I'm just not going to go and kill that off by cooking it and homogenizing it and all the things. I have been, we've been consuming raw dairy for 12 years and we have never even gotten the slightest stomach ache Nothing ever. at all. Like there has never been anything. I can tell when we start drinking store-bought dairy that I don't know, I just don't feel as good on it. It's just, right. it's not the same. And so for us, to us, it's common sense. And I understand that it's not like that for everybody. If you're not comfortable with it, then don't drink it. I mean, right. we milk our own raw milk. So we know exactly, we know the whole process. We know what the cow is eating. We know the conditions that the cow is living in. Right. You know. I would say definitely um, know where your food comes from. Absolutely. I mean, don't, I would not want to drink raw milk off of just a conventional dairy. I would not trust that. Um, the things that they're eating, the conditions they're in and stuff like that. I would not want that. But from somebody that I know is um, going to be doing a good job with it, we've gotten raw milk from several different people before we had our own cow. And when we go on trips, you know, we know people or whatever and raw milk from them and never had a problem at all. We've even, you know, drank raw milk from people that really didn't have the best <laughs> practices, <laughs> but we're totally fine. It's just, it's not as just like crazy as it's made out to be. Um, but I am very picky about keeping everything clean. I'm not on the end of sanitizing everything. We I don't, don't bleach things. Yeah, and I don't like, use sanitizers yeah. and stuff like that. But I am very clean, very picky about its hand, about how it's handled. It gets cooled as it's being milked. There's ice cubes or like uh, stainless steel ice cubes in there cooling as it milks. It comes in here and it gets strained through a disposable filter. And then it goes into the freezer for like an hour. and it gets, So it's getting chilled as quick as possible and it's as clean as possible and if you do those things it's just yeah. it's good the reason they started pasteurizing and homogenizing milk in the first place was because of unclean living conditions with the cows right. and so in my opinion if you if your cow is not in a place where it's there's going to be like all kinds of e coli and salmonella and all the things you're fine i mean yep. and the thing is one of my friends recently told me that her and her children all got salmonella poisoning from some greens that they ate at the grocery store. And I was like, I was horrified. I was like, what? Like you actually got poisoned from, from lettuce. And so, you know, any food is going to come with a small risk. Right. Anything you, anything you put in your mouth has a very small risk to it. And it's I, alive and it's supposed to be alive. Exactly. If your food is alive, it's yeah. All right. We will move on. We have some practical questions we want to answer, just um, a bunch of stuff about gardening and whatever. Um, I know somebody did ask earlier, what have we planted out so far in the garden? Oh, uh, I have arugula and lettuce and some dill. And then I have cabbage and broccoli. And I have rhubarb coming up. I have asparagus coming up. The raspberries are starting to pop up. But, oh, and I also planted out some nasturtiums just simply because they were like getting way too tall and leggy under my grow light. So I just put them out. And this time of the year, like we can still have some freezing temps at night. So I just put buckets over them. Yeah. And they're totally fine out there. We have to be careful, but the madness has begun. The madness has begun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Michelle's going to answer most of these, I think, because she is the garden ninja. <laughs> All right. Do you prefer raised beds over in ground mm -hmm. or do you like a combo of the two? I think you do both. We're a family of 13 plus grandma, so I'm still trying to figure out what would be best. We've gardened a little, but not on the scale we're hoping to, uh, growing a majority of all that we eat. 
that's an interesting question. I don't think I've ever answered this question for anybody yet. Like I used to like proclaim that uh, raised beds are for pansies. <laughs> I just, I don't know. They always just reminded me of this like country woman, you know, country gardener. Magazine. Yeah. Country woman magazine gardener. I just didn't think they were for me, but we had some really bad um, waterlogged soil issues in our garden. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to have Cody just build me two raised beds and I'll see if I like them. And I loved him. And so he built me 10. (laughs) Now I have 10 of them, but I will say there are definitely things that I prefer. I don't, I wouldn't see any point in growing certain things in a raised bed. So I can't really imagine growing 500 pounds of potatoes in raised beds. Like you would need so many raised beds for that amount of potatoes. And then like digging them in a raised bed, I think would just be hard. Which we did dig sweet potatoes. That's different though. It is different. Mm -hmm. Um, because sweet potatoes more they're like right at the base you can pull it up it's just it's different if i was going to if i was going to grow potatoes in a container i think i would do grow bags or something i'm just not Mm. sure something that you could just like you wouldn't have to actually like physically dig i don't know so for me i prefer my potatoes in ground especially if you have nice soil um we have like gotten the soil in our gardens to a place where it's nice and soft and potatoes can get nice and big. Mm-hmm. So also like tomatoes, they're already so tall, especially like indeterminate tomatoes. I wouldn't see a point in planting tomatoes in a raised right. bed. Something I mean, like you can. Corn, something like corn and yeah. tomatoes, both we've had like blow down in the wind. And I feel like if we put them even higher, mm-hmm. then uh, it could be even worse blowing over. Yeah. So. Something to be better in the ground. Right. Like I, the things that I plant in raised beds are things like green beans and carrots and garlic and cabbage and broccoli, like shorter things I Mm. think work super well in raised beds. Raised beds for me have cut way down on weeding. I mean, I feel like last year I planted probably like half of my garden in raised beds because I have 10 of them now and it cut way down on Mm -hmm. so many things. I can't even explain explain it all like why it's easier but it's so much more organized and i think manageable and like for her like she'll decide okay i'm gonna weed one raised bed every day for the next week or you know week and a half Mm -hmm. and i'll get them all done Mm -hmm. rather than just looking at this giant garden and it all needs to be weeded and it's overwhelming and weeds aren't going to be growing in from the sides of your garden like where the grass meets the the garden i feel like that was another big thing so I definitely love raised beds, especially I love raised beds, especially for if you have like clay soil or soil that doesn't drain well, it's really nice to have raised beds because you can put whatever soil you want in there. That's why I tell beginning gardeners that they should use raised beds because they're just, I just think they're so such a good way to get exactly the soil you want and have really good results right off the bat so yeah. that you're not yeah. discouraged. So I want to sorry. grab a couple of comments okay. before we keep going with that. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody asked, have you made anything else besides mead? I'm so excited to try more now that I started mead. I haven't started mm-hmm. anything else. And actually my mead is ready to bottle and I haven't done it yet. It's still just sitting in the jug, but it is ready. It tastes so good. It is so good. I would really like for Cody to make raspberry wine. Yes. We have a ton one. of extra raspberries. I was actually looking up recipes yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and since the mead turned out so good, I'm like, man, that would be so good as raspberry wine. I also need yeah. to start another batch of mead because... That stuff ain't getting nice long. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, man. Somebody also asked if we have accidentally burned our garden with compost. No. I mean, if you're going to burn your garden with compost, that means it didn't compost long enough. Right. So if you can, like, if you smell your compost and it does not, if it, if it doesn't it just smell, smell like earthy. total dirt, and then I would not put it on your garden. Like things that will burn your garden are like if you have chicken manure that's not composted enough and you put that on your garden, you will burn your plants. Um, but if you have properly composted compost, it will not burn your garden. I mean, last year we put on like a thick layer. It was probably like a foot deep. Yep. And are you sure? No, I don't think I am. It was a lot and it was totally fine. So I would say, yeah, we have never had And compost. properly composted being relative because we don't do the best with our compost pile. But it's been sitting out for like two or three It's been sitting long enough. I'm just saying yeah. it's not like we don't do all of the turning mm-hmm. and the right temperatures and everything like that. We put all of our manure and bedding and stuff on a pile and it sits for two years and then we use it on the garden. That's compost. 
<laughs> Lazy man's compost and it works just fine. Yes, it does. Our soil um, has got, it's like built up over the years. So mm -hmm. I know that our compost, it might not be done 100% properly, but it is amazing. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to say about raised beds is that there's pros and cons to raised beds. Um, raised beds, since they drain so much better, you're also going to have to water them quicker than you would if something is in ground. And so for that reason, I really love to have some things in ground so that I don't have to water everything. Here in Ohio, I barely have to water at all, even raised beds. But if there is a dry season, I'm watering those raised beds like, you know, mm -hmm. every other day. And that can take up quite a bit of time. So for that reason, I really like to have potatoes and things like that in in the ground so that I don't have to water everything. Right. We are actually going to try something different this year. It wasn't on our list of things to try, but um, we stopped in at Berlin Seeds uh, a week to a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And the guy there gave us a couple bags of biochar to try. And he said to put it in our raised beds because it will help it to retain moisture and nutrients. So we're gonna put some of that in a couple of the raised beds and see how it works with those. And I'm excited to see that. I've heard a lot of good stuff about biochar. We've just never done it. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, somebody asked if we homeschool and we do, yeah. and we are going to talk about that in just a little bit. We just finished homeschool today, <laughs> yeah. which is crazy. I don't have to do school tomorrow. It's amazing. Honestly, so amazing. I saw some um, questions about leaves. Um, people asking if they get slimy. Uh, they do not get slimy at all. I mean, once they are on your garden, they're not going to be disgusting. I putting leaves leaf mulch on our garden has helped our garden more than uh, next to compost. I think it's made the soil better than anything else. I mean, it's not just the soil; it's just the mulching Everything. job that it does is incredible. They will like mat down and make so that like light and air can't not air but it makes so that the weeds don't pop up as much like straw if you mulch with straw the... if you think about it it's just a lot of little sticks on top of each other yeah. there's a lot of holes lot of um holes and the fun. the leaves make like a mat they're matted on top of each other and it mulches really really well um and there was another question that somebody had um asked about that love the idea of mulching with leaves how do they not just all blow away mm -hmm. just covered all my potatoes with leaves only a quarter of them are left you might get too much wind or I'm wondering if you wait to mulch until the plants have grown and that's kind of what keeps the leaves where they belong. I know keeping them wet helps, but I can't be watering every other day. <laughs> no. no, I mean, we get our leaves shredded. I think that's a pretty important piece of the whole leaf mulch thing. Uh, we have big piles of shredded leaves. I do wait to mulch my plants, especially like things like squash and cucumbers, like heat loving plants. You don't want to mulch them too soon because it'll keep the soil cool and they're not going to grow as well. So I always wait to mulch until the plants are well established. Mm -hmm. And we then might have I to do like on. we'll plant we'll we'll till the garden, plant the plants, and then we'll probably have to do like at least one weeding mm -hmm. before we mulch it. Yeah. I wanna say something real quick. Uh mm -hmm. somebody said they need to jump off that they're interested in the topic of homeschool. Will this live be posted later? Yes, it will. This will be on our YouTube channel. You can find it later. You won't get to be a part of the live chat, but mm -hmm. you find it later. Yes. Um, I think you were still talking about leaves. I interrupted. Sorry. Oh, it's all good. I was just going to say, like, shredding them is an important piece of the puzzle. And also, when we leave our our leaves out in a pile over winter and they start breaking down, like, by the time we put them on our garden, they already have, like, some earthworms and stuff in them. So that also makes, like, when they're wet and stuck together and stuff, they're going to stay laying down much better than if they're just, like, loose, fluffy leaves. Right. So I think that's another piece of it is that you want them slightly, not composted, but... You want them to be breaking down already right. when you put them on your garden. Yeah, a so, couple of people just yeah. said if you shred the leaves of the lawnmower before adding them oh. to a compost pile, they will break down a mm -hmm. lot faster, um, yeah. seeing them over them and stuff. Yeah, and it's true. And that's okay. what it was. It was a lawn service that we got them from, and they would drive their mower around to bag the leaves, and then they bring it here. So they were shredded. So, yeah. All right. Uh, we have a question. Actually, Cindy Lou asked a bunch of questions, so I'll just give you one after the other. Um, so Cindy Lou asked, do you use fertilizer other than compost? And if so, on and in, on what plants? Um, so I use the pretty much the only fertilizers that I use are liquid fish, which smells horrible, but it works. <laughs> works liquid great. fish and then um, liquid seaweed. I like liquid seaweed the best because it doesn't smell bad. Um, it can be pretty rotten to like fertilize your garden and just have fish wafting in through your open windows through the day. 
but I very, very rarely fertilize, honestly. Right. I mean, I might fertilize some things in the spring, um, but not very much, honestly. If I see a plant that's really needing some help, I'll fertilize it. Um, we really try to rely the most on our compost. Compost, yeah. yeah. There's so much nutrients in there. And I feel like if you're building up your soil, mm -hmm. you got the right minerals. We're actually, we amended our soil this year. We got a soil test done and we want to make sure we got the right minerals in there and stuff. Sometimes um, fertilizers, especially like commercial fertilizers and stuff, they'll actually they throw things off. They throw things off. They put too much of mm -hmm. some things in there and stuff. So you want to be really careful with fertilizing. Yeah. Compost is the best. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd also recommend the seaweed in the fish. Yes. One thing I will say is like if I'm going to do like a spray for like my tomatoes get fungus really easily. So do my squash and cucumbers. I often will just put a little dunk of um, fertilizer like liquid seaweed or fish in with the antifungal like we only use organic sprays but i'll just put a little bit of that in there because if they have fungus they probably need a nutrient boost and so it's like a gentle like foliar feed right um, so i will do that if i'm spraying anyways so. yeah i see we got a super sticker from truck and dave thank, thank you, you so much we appreciate that thank you all right we're going to keep going with some of cindy lou's questions um are you still homeschooling Yes. Just kind of well, start. I mean, I just finished today, but yes, we are homeschooling. I use Masterbooks curriculum and I just like um, I only homeschool from October to this is April. So I, I shoot to be done with school by the end of April so that I'm not homeschooling at all in gardening season. Yeah. And then I just keep the, the kids. I keep their learning continuing through the summer by having them read for an hour and a half every afternoon. Yeah. And I mean, our life is homeschool. It is. I mean. The stuff we're doing in our homestead, they're counting the eggs when they gather them. They mm -hmm. are figuring out story problems and stuff all day, every day. They're learning science with all the different things we're doing with the microbes and the, you know, the beneficial insects mm -hmm. and all that stuff. That's that's all schooling. Yes. So absolutely. Uh, let's see. How are the onion starts working out? And is it your new favorite way? I wish I could say it was my new favorite way. I feel like they're just kind of sitting there. And I'm wondering, so I did send them out recently because I thought maybe they weren't growing more because they're too close together. Um, they they look fine. They're just, I feel like they're not big enough yet to plant out. So I bought, I just planted the ones that I had ordered. I was going to do half and half this year, half that I ordered and half that I started at home, just so that I wouldn't completely flop the whole thing by doing it all myself. And I'm going to plant them out. They just look really, really fragile. So I'm going to leave them in here for a while yet and then plant them out and we'll have to see. But yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay. What are your plans for meat chickens? With breed, when do you start? Spec, when you try to butcher? July heat sounds unfun. The butchering. Sure does. I guess I'll answer that one. Mm -hmm. So our plans for meat chickens? Interesting that you ask. Because we are actually getting our meat chickens this week. Should be getting chicks probably uh, maybe tomorrow or the next day. Um, they come in the mail. We get them from Meyer Hatchery. I really like them. We get the Rainbow Rangers. I really, really like those. And I would recommend them, highly recommend them for anybody getting started with broiler chickens. Um, I have never actually raised the Cornish Cross myself. But I know people who have. Um, my cousin actually worked for Polyface Farms in virginia and he raised them on like on a large scale and stuff and even if you read joel salison's book about um raising chickens for profit and stuff like that um they are the way joel salison puts it is they are a race car chicken they can perform really really well but they have to have just the right fuel for them to perform really really well um and they they're just a lot more finicky the cornish cross are they have heart problems leg problems and if you're wanting to do a pastured operation or whatever um they will just sit by the feeder and eat feed all day long and they'll just get fat and obviously that's building a bigger bird but is it building a healthier bird i don't think so um some people might argue with me i don't know but i just we do the rainbow rangers and they're in a chicken tractor out on the lawn or out in the pasture and they they're eating grass and bugs and stuff all day long they're a really good pasture chicken and they grow really well um in comparison a cornish cross finishes in about seven to eight weeks and uh rainbow ranger is about 10 to 11 weeks so it does take a few weeks longer it's going to cost a little bit more but i just feel like it's an all-around better bird they taste really really good they do yeah so i would highly recommend those um and so 
when do you start? Like I said, um, our chicks are coming um, this week and it does, we do try to make so it doesn't get too hot later on. These do take a little longer and so it will be kind of hot once they are ready to be butchered. Um, I try to start them as early as possible to a certain extent, but they are, we raise them in a brooder outside that I can put a heat lamp in there, but it's not like temperature controlled. So I have to be careful that I don't start them too early because if it's too early and it gets really, really cold, um, we could lose birds pretty quickly if we're not paying close enough attention and stuff. Um, but we don't actually butcher them ourselves. We get somebody else to butcher them. And so I'm not really affected by the butcher date. It's more about like um, having really fat, heavy birds in the middle of summer when it's really hot. That can be really hard on them. So take that into consideration if you're thinking about it for yourself. Somebody here was asking about butchering the birds. So we actually get them butchered um, from an Amish farm nearby. I think you said that. Mm -hmm. And we have them like cut them. Oh, how do they do it? Do they cut they quarter it? it? They quarter it. So you've got the breastbone and then you have the legs and the thighs and the wings all separate. I put those into separate bags and then, you know, we'll have chicken breast for one meal and then we'll have um, the rest of the, the pieces for another meal. So the so. question specifically, um, the other day I watched a cooking video and you cut the breast off the bone. Last year was our first year doing meat birds, but we don't eat many roasters. So that means I still have roasters from June. It's just not ideal for us to eat them that way due to the time it takes to make them. How do you cut up your birds? Why do you leave the breast on the bone versus storing them cut off the bone? Thank you so much. I just basically don't feel like taking the time on butcher day to cut the breast off of like 50 chickens. Like that just looks really, really big to me. I would rather just stick them in freezer bags and cut them off as I am cooking. Mm -hmm. So it's just totally a, a me thing. Like it's right. just what I think is most efficient because usually our coolers come back from the butcher in the evening around. They're like, not bagged or anything. Either. Not bagged They're or anything. Seven o'clock, we have to bag them all and get them into the freezer. Mm -hmm. And if I was to like cut everything up yet that evening, it would take me like into the wee hours of the night. I don't function yet at night. And mm -hmm. so I just, I just choose to stick them in bags and yeah. deal with it once. Um, once they're thawed. Yeah. So. Um, there's a couple more questions here. I did want mm -hmm. to say something about this. One comment here that I saw. You guys have inspired me to start my journey in gardening mm -hmm. and can't thank you guys enough. I will learn this year how to can my own food and hopefully store things throughout this winter. Nice. I, I've i seen a few comments like that on um, Michelle's Instagram and on our YouTube channel about having inspired people to start gardening. And it just gets me right here every single yeah. time. And it's just so good to hear. I really appreciate people letting us know what we're doing. Sometimes, honestly, um, this YouTube thing, it can like, it can really wear you down. It's, it's a lot. We put a lot of heart into these videos. We put a lot of time into these videos. We get really close to burning out with making the videos and trying to get all of the homestead stuff done at the same time and everything like that. And when there's comments like that, it, That's it really what motivates us, honestly. Yeah, and it it's so exciting. Like we genuinely love what we're doing. Yeah. We feel very fulfilled in what we're doing. We have no plans of going anywhere. We right. we're here for the long haul and it's it's just really exciting and fun to see that we're making a difference, put it that way. Right. Yeah. Another super sticker from Jamie. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Uh question here from Truck and Dave. I want to grab this real quick too. Uh do you have uh, do you have plan or use dual purpose chickens? If so, can you tell a difference in taste? So this is a very interesting question because we have done this before. Uh, my idea was when we started homesteading, I was honestly very idealistic about a lot of things. Um, one of those was getting like all heritage breeds and heirloom varieties and stuff like that. And so one of those things was using dual purpose chickens. Um, we started selling eggs like as a side business. And we very quickly found out that the dual purpose chickens do not lay good enough yeah. to sustain an egg business. Yeah. And I also very quickly found out I raised a batch of Delaware roosters only, uh, the Delaware breed versus um, Cornish or not Cornish, uh, Rainbow Rangers. I raised them at the same time. I started the Rangers later. So I think they were done about the same time. Massive, massive difference in the size of yeah. the Rangers versus the size of the Delawares. And those Delawares, I had to raise for like 18 weeks to get them to a decent size. And by then they were just tough. They so, were so tough. As far as like actual taste taste, mm -hmm. I don't remember there being a difference besides the Delawares were tough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
And so I would, I would not recommend that. I mean, it's not just like if you want to just have a backyard flock of chickens and then once they're a couple years old and you want to butcher them instead of getting rid of them another way or whatever, pressure I mean, go for them, something. pressure can them, slow cook them. It can still make a good meal or whatever. But if you're actually wanting to get a good amount of eggs and get good meat, just do two separate batches. Yeah. That's what I would highly recommend. Yeah. Yep. Yep. How many Jimmy Nardello <laughs> plants can keep Cody happy? <laughs> I usually do two. Yeah. yeah two plants. Yeah. It's just enough for me to go out to the garden and snack <laughs> every, every now and then. Those are just amazing. As far as peppers go. I'm not a big vegetable guy, honestly, but those Jimmy Nardello peppers, really good. Calico Cow Acres, you guys are inspiring homesteaders and us fellow YouTubers. Thanks so much. And by the way, Calico Acres, Calico Cow Acres is moderating in this live, and you should go check out their channel. Definitely check channel. out their channel, guys. Yeah. They were just recently in the one of their videos was in the Film Fest along with ours, the um, Abundance Plus Film Fest. A couple more questions here, and we'll also, if we get a couple good ones here, we might do a couple more. But we are starting to go over time, so this is fun though. Um, can you please explain about the process of making colostrum butter? I thought that'd be a simple one. So to make colostrum butter, it's literally just the same as any other butter. I just let the, I just put the colostrum into the refrigerator for a couple of days, and it you want to have that nice hard cream line. Colostrum will have cream just like other milk. It's like neon yellow. It's creepily yellow. Right. And you just skim that off and make butter. And the butter, it will, it's it's a showstopper, put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just exactly the same process as you would with normal milk. Yep. So. Yep. Um, okay. And we've got one more question on our paper here. What can you do about grubs? They're in our garden and we tried treating them last year with a little bit of neem oil. We are in Ohio as well. Don't have anything in the garden yet because we're afraid of the grubs taking over and killing everything off. So I don't have a ton to say on grubs, but we definitely have some grubs too. And I never really noticed them doing anything. I don't think I would be too worried about it. I mean, if they were decimating your garden last year and then maybe, maybe they're going to be an issue again this year. But for us, they haven't been. Um, I, I don't know that we've ever had any issues from grubs. I mean, we see them in there, we see them in there, but they just don't seem to really do anything. Yeah. The only thing that maybe they would do is like eat your, like take a bite out of a sweet potato. We do have something in our soil that will sometimes take bites out of our sweet potatoes, but the bites heal over and they, the potatoes still store well. So even that, I don't think, yeah, I don't think that would be an issue. Right. So. I thought we could, that was all that we have um, on our paper here, but I thought we could grab a couple questions that are coming in right here at the end. Um, I know somebody asked earlier when our next live stream will be. We don't have that planned out. We want to try to do it like once a month, but obviously that hasn't been happening. So <laughs> Cody, how is the cheese making going? <laughs> um, cheese making? What cheese making? We've not gotten there yet. I watched some videos about it and I was planning on doing it. Just didn't get to it. Now spring is coming. I didn't get it done. We are, though, going to be weaning our calf soon. And so we're going to have a lot of milk. Lot and milk, so we might end up. We might that. have to do that. Yeah. Basically, around here in the spring, things are crazy. And so we just haven't been getting everything done. Yeah. So let's just do some like lightning answers for some of these before we hop off of here. Uh, have you tried making other cheeses? You know, that was <laughs> uh, can you help me with raspberry bushes? How do you keep them healthy? I honestly, I just compost them. I water them if it gets really, really dry, which does not happen very often here in Ohio. Another thing that I do that I think helps to keep them healthy is every year um, in the early, early spring, I just, we just whack them off all the way to the ground and let them grow up into new, a whole new plant. Other than that, honestly, I don't do a ton. Right. I have heard though, we are, the variety of raspberries that we have is heritage and um, I have heard that you can't do that with all varieties. So oh, okay. that's with heritage raspberries. Um, I think one of the biggest things for us is every year I till beside it and I keep our patch only about, I mean, you probably can't tell on the screen, but only about two feet wide. And then we also trellis them. There's a trellis on the outside of them that holds them upright. Yeah. So they get really good airflow. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things. I feel like if we would let them get really wide, and not trust them where they're laying around and they're like not getting the airflow they need. I don't think they'd be in your I've definitely noticed that the branches that hang down the ground, the bugs get to the berries, they're just mm -hmm. not as nice. So trellis them and prune them properly, let them have airflow, and hopefully they'll do okay for you. Yeah. So. Uh, natural pest control for gardens. 
Uh, depends what bug you're. <laughs> I mean, mostly, diatomaceous earth. Yeah, I haven't had the greatest success, honestly, with diatomaceous earth. But round. Um, I love. I think my favorite one is. Oh boy, I can't get it. Not surround. It starts with an S. Spin of sad. Spinosad and BT are both really, really great organic sprays that I personally feel very good about. Yeah. Um, hopping on late. Have you ever discussed where to place things once you get the homestead land, animals, barns, garden, once you know where home is going? Uh, we talked about that kind of a little bit earlier in this video. We also do have at least one video, if not two videos, of kind of where our stuff is. So um, I'll try to put a link for those in the description so you can check those out. Uh, let's see. I know there was a couple more on here. Where do you get your apple mint seeds? Berlin seeds don't have any this year. Hmm. I get uh, mine at a local greenhouse. So. No, but you don't get seeds though. Oh, seeds. So okay. a lot of people have asked this and Berlin seeds, I mean, as far as I know, they should have the plants. Um, they have it in their catalog at least. I know they don't have seeds in their catalog at all. Uh, I'm pretty sure anyways. I could be wrong on that, but hmm. I don't think they have seeds in their catalog, but they do have apple mint plants in their catalog. <clears throat> and we also got ours from a local greenhouse. I just got mine as plants. <clears throat> yeah, so we got mine as plants. Looked into the seeds. Yeah. 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 Um, this question somehow always comes up. Hey, all I've noticed a Christian presence. Do y'all ever plan on talking about faith and how it influences your homesteading life? So um, we've mentioned this a few times. We definitely are Christians, and we're not ashamed of that Absolutely. whatsoever. Um, but we don't want to use our channel as a soapbox. So we just don't, we don't just like preach it and talk about it a lot and stuff. We just live it. And I think that's probably how we'll keep it. I personally believe that that's the best witness is um, showing your face rather than talking about it all the time. I think that our culture is at a place where they're done with preaching and they're ready to see people living a happy life. And yeah. um, so I guess that's where we come from with it. We just want to show the way we live, show our lifestyle and let that speak for itself. Yeah. So. And how it influences our homesteading life. I think, honestly, one of the biggest things mm -hmm. is that we just appreciate God's creation so much. Yeah. And we try to work with nature instead of working against it because mm -hmm. nature works because God created it that way. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Absolutely. How do you power your electric fences? Uh, our front pasture up here um, ha is plugged in. We've got electric in our barn. And our back pasture, I have a solar fencer. It really works really well. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I think we're probably done. The questions and stuff keep coming in and we could be on here a long time, but this is already officially our longest live stream. Um, uh, but I think we're going to have to head out because we want to hang out with our kids tonight and stuff. So thank you so much, each of you for showing up. Saw people coming from a lot of different places yeah. and just really great to be able to hang out in one spot. Uh, if you get a chance, if you can make it come to the, uh, Food Independence Summit in Holmes County in June. We would love to see you guys there. So we'll talk to you again soon. We have a, another video coming out next Monday. Thank you all for your support. Yep. See ya.